We're Sisters in Crime Australia and we've been celebrating crime writing since 1991. Welcome to Murder Mondays. Every Monday we'll ask a crime writer to talk about her crime craft. I'm Karina Kilmore. I'm a journalist, I'm a debut crime writer, and I'm in Kavina for Sisters in Crime. Before I introduce Dervla McTiernan, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Thank you. Dervla, you've had a fantastic rise since the first of your Detective Cormac Riley books, The Ruin. It was published in 2018 and last year it won the Davitt and the Ned Kelly Awards. And this year in the US, it's won the Barry Award. Barry. And it's also been optioned for Hopscotch Films. Mm. Then came the second in the series, The Scholar, in 2019. And now you have just released a third. Your life has certainly changed since moving from Ireland to Western Australia nine years ago. Mm. Before we get to the questions, give us the elevator pitch for your latest novel, The Good Turn. Gosh, I'm almost out of practice with this, Karina. It's been a while since I've done my little pitch, but The Good Turn, and I'll show you, this is the cover. The Good Turn um, starts with Anna Collins. Anna is a young single mother living in North Dublin in very difficult circumstances, and her little girl, Tilly, has stopped speaking. In mm -hmm. fact, Tilly hasn't said a word for three months. So Anna brings her to the doctor, and the doctor suspects that she's witnessed some sort of trauma or difficult situation, and he kind of intimates he's going to bring in social workers. So Anna's very afraid she's going to lose her daughter. She takes her and she runs. She disappears into the west of Ireland. Um, meanwhile, back in Galway, Cormac Riley and Peter Fisher are investigating the abduction of another little girl, but they're not having the kind of support that you'd expect them to get from the police force. In fact, they're getting no support at all. So they're down to a, a kind of a skeleton crew. And in those circumstances, Peter makes a fatal mistake. And he's all but banished to this little fishing village on the far west coast of Ireland. So we've got Anna and Peter in this little village and Cormac back in Galway really trying to get to the bottom of this sort of internal resistance within the police force, the potential corruption and trying to save himself and Peter and maybe even the greater good. So that's the good turn. I can't tell you any more without major spoilers. <laughs> oh, that sounds fabulous. I have to confess, I've already read it. So I know all the spoilers. <laughs> now I'm going to shuffle our cards. These are questions from our sisters mm -hmm. and we'll just start where we land. Okay. Nervous. How much of you is in one of your characters? Depends on the character. Um, in some cases there is a bit, um, but it's never the whole me, it's just a version of me. You know, I think every writer draws from their own experience. So um, Maud in The Ruin, there are little parts of me and her, but oh, she ends yeah. up being a very different person. Um, even Cormac probably has aspects of my personality, but they're just little, little snippets. So the whole person is completely different. Great. Does your main character ever surprise you? Oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> I, de I definitely am one of those writers whose characters speak to her. Um, I know I hear some, some writers talk about that. They don't come to life in that way. But I do start every book with a plan and I never finish with the same plan. So mm -hmm. as characters kind of become more real to me, it, the, light, the story takes on its own sort of trajectory. And I will recast my plan and recast my plan. I'm always working to some sort of plan, but it changes dramatically through the course of writing the book. Okay. What's the best way to dig yourself out of a bad plot? Ha ha ha, go back until you find good plot. Oh. Cut away the wood every single time. You know it when you've lost it. You know, you know it when you've lost it and you can feel it in your writing. I've, I've done the thing where you keep going, you know, yeah. despite it and you can push through. Like yeah. you can write 30,000 words with your head, but you've lost the heart and you've lost the feel that makes it feel real. And, you know, at some point you're going to have to cut all those words. So you're better off the moment you recognize you've lost it, go back and cut the dead wood and rebuild from where it was last feeling good to you. Wow, that's so cutthroat, Dervla. The only way, man, the more you put it off, the worse it gets. <laughs> <laughs> How do you decide the scene of a crime? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it used to be pretty 
organic for me like it just kind of came about through the story it still is to some degree but I'm probably thinking about it a little bit more now I'm trying to make every scene work on every level um, every scene has to sing for its place in the book or, or it has to go you know it, it really does so when you're talking about scene of the crime you really want it to be evocative on every level that it can be so it has to be maybe poignant or dramatic or you know, scenic or cinematic or something. It has to be playing on every level. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking about it on, on all of those levels now. Wow. Trying. <laughs> Do you start with the plot or the character? Character. That's an easy one. Oh, yeah. yeah. Plot comes from character, you know? I mean, without that, it's just an episodic thing where one thing follows another, but they're not really connected. You need, you know what the character needs and wants and what they're um what resistance they're experiencing for me is what generates the plot yeah cool how many drafts do you write before handing it in <laughs> uh depends on the book usually at least three um before it goes even to my agent and then another draft with my agent maybe more and then it will go to my editors and with all of the books so far, we've done one good big structural edit and then a more significant edit after that, or like a smaller structural, like cleaning up a few bits. Cause I tend to rewrite a lot in the structural edit. Mm -hmm. Like I'll take my editors, all of my editors comments, and then I'll read the book with those in mind, plus my own thoughts. And then I will write a new plan for what, what work I think needs to be done for the book. So on all of the books, including the good turn, I did a pretty significant structural edit. So by the time it goes back to my editors, then there's, there will be little things that will have changed that will need to clean up for that before yeah. we move on to copy editing. So there's a, there's a fair few drafts, at least three anyway, before it leaves my desk. Yeah. And I'll just sneak in an extra question there. Do you have a reader, an early reader before you show your agent or how do you do that? Uh, I make Kenny read it. <laughs> whether he likes my husband, whether he likes it or not. Um, and I watch him and he tends to read it on his iPad and he tends to read in bed. So I'm, I'm looking for this moment where it's like, <laughs> oh and I know I've lost him and then I look over and see when did he go to sleep and I know I've got a problem in that chapter but he's always read for me from the very beginning and it's it's always been really helpful because he's very honest um and he's got a really even though he doesn't read a lot of fiction he has a very good instinct for story so you know he knows when he knows the kind of thing I'm looking for him to really examine so we can talk about it in a really useful way so he never actually reads the final version of any of my books because he's usually read so many bits and pieces of drafts that by the time the thing is actually published, he's almost as allergic to the story as I am. <laughs> so, um, but he's my earliest reader for sure. What research did you do for your latest novel? Um, bits and pieces. I did more research about police procedure and police and, um, you know, organizational structures again, just to kind of refresh mm -hmm. my memory on some of that. Some of which I use and some of which I don't, if it doesn't work with the story. Um, I did a bit of research on, on this selective mutism that some children experience because it's yeah. very hard for the plot. Um, different things like minor things, like there was a major snowstorm in Ireland a couple of years ago, which kind of inspired some of the weather in the later part of the book for me. And I wanted to see, I knew quite a bit about that, but I wanted to go back and look at the specifics of it. So I didn't mess anything up yeah. um, because heavy snow like that in Ireland where a blizzard really closes in is actually quite a rare event. So, um, and I know that obviously from my own experience, but I just wanted to get that, that thing right. So those sorts of things really. Yeah, I remember that blizzard from the book. I still feel cold from it. <laughs> good. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> How much of a profile do you do for each character before you write them? Oh, very lengthy ones. Actually, I have all my notebooks out at the moment, so they're all spread around me, but I do do quite a lot. Um, I used to work from, you know, one of those character sheet things. I tend not to do that so much anymore, but they're, I think they're still at the back of my mind. So I do start with the basic stuff, physical characteristics and history, and then I just start to write. Usually I'll have handwritten pages and pages about each character before I even consider putting um, fingers to the keyboard because that's where a lot of the story generation will come from for me. Like I'll have a general story idea for the book and I'll have a pretty clear idea of at least one character that I can feel very strongly about. And then I'll expand on that character. And as I do that, the people in their lives, you know, kind of self-generate and then, then I expand on them. And just through the writing about those characters in the context of the story, a lot of the plot and story comes out through that. Mm. So that's, I spend a couple of weeks doing that before I start writing and it's a really important part of the process for me. 
And did you say, Dervla, you handwrite those notes? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I, I do. And I handwriting is a good, still a good big part of the process for me. Like all, all most of my writing I'm typing, but I will occasionally handwrite a scene. I often handwrite stuff that is like an exercise for me that helps me know a character better. Mm -hmm. Anything that's very, very creating something out of nothing, um, I tend to handwrite. Oh. Hmm. What's the scariest thing in your novel? <laughs> oh my God, that's a horrible question. I don't know. I, ooh, what's the scariest <laughs> thing in my novel? Can I pass on that one? That would sure. be a you see. I can't <laughs> I'm we'll passing. let you pass. Okay. I'm passing on that one. <laughs> I might come back to you on that one. Yeah. How do you write about sex? Now you can't, you've had your one and only pass. No, so. no. Actually, this is fine because I don't tend to write sex in my books. Oh. I tend to, um, certainly there is, there, you know, there are people in relationships, so there are people who have sex, but usually my, my literary camera swings on just before or after. Do you, yeah. Did you see that Rebel Wilson movie this year? Or I saw, I've only seen the ad for it, but it was like a rom-com type thing where every single time, I think it was she had, oh, it was one of the Hemsworths or something, but the, some beautiful man. And then it would only, she only got to experience the intro and then wake up the next morning. She never got to oh. the act. Well, it's like that in my books. My characters never, never get to experience the act on the page, just the <laughs> before and the moment after. And that's it. Off camera. Yeah, off camera, exactly. <laughs> Who are your literary inspirations? So many. Um, mm. God, I mean, I've been reading crime fiction for years and years and years and years. So probably the writers I've been reading longest would be people like Michael Connolly and, um, and obviously Val McDermott, um, Ian Rankin and others. But, and then in recent years, I mean, Tan French, I adore her writing. Mm. Um, I am a big fan of the um, Robert Galbraith books, which I think okay. I might have mentioned before. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that they are just a masterclass in series writing and I'm so excited yes. because there's a new book coming out this, later this year. A new Tana book coming out actually in October, I think, if I'm right. Um, I think it you is, know, but yeah. There's so many writers today in Australia who are a massive inspiration. You know, mm -hmm. I'm reading your book right as we speak. Oh, I'm thank really you. It. <laughs> it's Jane not Harper. too scary for you, I hope. Not too scary for you. <laughs> and Jane Harper is fabulous, of course. And, you know, I'm very excited that she's got a new book coming out as well, because I just, I wait with bated breath for them, you know. So all of these writers who are doing such fabulous things at the moment, and, and you know, I, I'm just excited when I know the books are coming, and I can sit down and really just sink into them. They're just a joy to read. Yes, we're really lucky to be exposed these days to so many great writers, aren't we? For sure. When and how do you work out plot twists and red herrings? Ooh, um, all the way through and then all during the edit as well. You know, I'm always looking for an opportunity to do that. The book I just finished writing um, has a lot of twists and turns and a lot of that was just baked into the original premise of the book. Mm -hmm. and the nature of the characters but there were a couple of opportunities to add more and I think you know as you get a bit more experienced as a writer and you feel like you have a bit more control over what you're doing because certainly for me in the earlier books I mean I was flailing particularly the writing of the ruin you know I was just writing and writing and writing and hoping it ended up somewhere but now I have a lot more control over it so because of that it's giving me an opportunity to think more about what I'm actually trying to achieve at each mm -hmm. stage so I think that gives me more of an opportunity to kind of bake in twists and turns because you don't want to be sticking them on at the end. You know, you want them baked into the story. So I think the, the, the book I've just finished is definitely the twistiest um, and was really fun to write. So I hope it's going to be fun to read. Oh, fabulous. I can't wait. Are you a plotter or a pantser? I'm not sure if that's relevant now. You've almost sure. answered that. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a plotter. But there's a degree of organic stuff about it. I mean, every book has been a little bit different. I think now I'm I'm settling into my process. It's definitely involves a lot of planning, but I do respect um that organic feeling, like that instinctive feeling. You have to trust your instincts. And if you start to feel like you've lost your story and it's dying on you in your hands, yeah. you have to you know, recognize and acknowledge that and, and address it instead of kind of burying your head and going, I just have to keep going. I'm at 60,000 words. I'm so close. You know, you have to say, no, no, I've lost it somewhere. And shoving through is not going to solve the problem. I need to go back and unpick. 
and see where it went wrong. Because there's always a solution. It's just that you have to give yourself the time, take the pressure off for a while. Yeah. Go back into the story because it's, it's, your, it's your instinct that's telling you something's wrong. Yeah. And you need to just hear that and, and then go back and, and work organically for a while, I think. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, what's your top writing tip? And there's a second part to this question. What's your top self-editing tip? Haha. <laughs> okay, the first, the top writing tip is going to be really boring and I apologize, but it is still true. And that is routine, 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 routine. I think it helps to write at the same time every day in the same place as much as you can. And I think that um, respecting your writing, you know, having your own, the notebook that you like to use or the, you know, your laptop that you like to work with, whatever it is, in a quiet place and you show up every day and you do the work. I mean, that's what it comes down to because you can have all the inspiration and all the skill and all the talent in the world. If you're not sitting down at your desk, you're not going to have anything at the end. So just show up at the same time every day. I used to work at night because I was working during the day and I had the children in the afternoon and that suited me best. So, you know, I only had an hour and a half a day most days, but that's all you need. Um, a lot of people do early mornings, whatever it takes, you know, that, that you feel comfortable with. So that's my main writing tip. Um, Self-editing tip. Um, well, I don't know if many people do this, but one of the things I like to do is to read the book out loud to myself at a certain point. That's usually quite late in the editing process. Um, but so I'm usually at copy edit stage by the time I'm doing that. And it takes a long time and you're, you're quite far into the edit at that point. So you probably kind of are resistant to it, but actually it really helps you to, to see the rhythm and the feel of the pace of your words. And you find things that are extraneous and aren't necessary or you find things that actually that's not a very clear image or a very clear description of what's going on with the character at that moment. So it helps me just bring it to another level. Yeah, that's good. How would you write a crime book about the pandemic? Oh my God. Um, I don't know that I would try even. I was reading, I don't know if you've read the new Stephen King um, book of novellas and shorts and stuff. I've started. Yeah. There's a, there's a yeah. funny little sequence of kind of four, a story in four parts. Uh, I can't remember which one, the name of it, but at the beginning of it, a world is just coming to an end, you know, and he yeah. just draws it so brilliantly and so powerfully in such a short period of time. And I remember reading that and going, it's done. <laughs> yeah. I'm not even going to try this because that's the master and I can't. I can't do that, you know, yeah. um, it's just so phenomenal and so powerful and, and so brilliant. And I, right now I don't feel any need or wish to write in the period that we're experiencing. I guess we're all too, so, so close to it. Maybe in the future I might want to, but right now I, I don't think I'd find a story there, you know? Yeah. Too real. Mm. Yeah. Tell us something not in your book about a main character. <gasps> do that that might be in the future plots you never know what about you um god something about a character that isn't in the books well i don't know that there's a whole lot left right now i kind of feel like i finished a lot of it in the good turn there's stuff in the new book that i haven't put in that book um but it's way too soon to tell you about that i guess the best example i can think of but it's not as relevant anymore is for people who've just read the ruin and the scholar there were things about Peter Fisher's background, his history, his relationship with his father that I'd known about since the very first book because I wrote it when I created Peter. That was the reason for his kind of raw ambition in The Ruin. That was part of his character thing that I made for him then. And I never, it never appeared in the novel until it became a key part of The Good Turn. And I just, it was an important part of his backstory for me. So I really wanted the opportunity to write that. So when, you know, I got the chance in the good turn, it, it's there in all its living color. Oh, but good. it wasn't there in the, the ruin of the scholar. Yeah. And we're up to our last question, Dover. Okay. How would you get away with murder? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Hmm. Have you ever found yourself plotting a murder? Then see if you <laughs> do it. Um, I only thought of it the other day. There was a newspaper report that there, um, you know, those, what do they call it? Deadly nightshade, the little, the mushrooms had been found in various yeah. people's gardens and they were giving examples of people who had actually picked them and, and poisoned themselves with them and they are potentially lethal. So I did have to admit, I did at that point start plotting and thinking, how could you use those and actually get away from it? 
but I, I didn't successfully plot the murder because I think it takes about two weeks for it to kill you. So the uh, person is too bound, long. Yeah, they, they're bound to seek medical treatment in the meantime, and then they'll be asked, did you cook these mushrooms for yourself? So I ran into a problem. However, give me time. I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for being with us today, Dervla, and we'll look forward to the new book coming out. When is that coming out exactly? Oh, it'll be sometime next year. I don't have a date for that one yeah, yet. Next year, yeah. yeah it's a good term. So thank you for joining us on Murder Mondays. Thank you for having me, Karina. It's lovely to see you and lovely to answer your very tricky questions. <laughs>